The following program has been produced by Cornell Pump Company as an ongoing complimentary training program to assist our customers in the proper removal and replacement of the mechanical shaft seal in our models 1.5 CB and 1.5 CLB refrigerant pumps. It will also cover the different procedures for the models 2CB and 2CBS. This video serves as a supplement to the refrigerant pump seal instructions number 3200-435 through 3200-435.5 and 3200-440 through 3200-440.5 available in your Cornell refrigerant pump catalog or as is included in your replacement seal kit. During this program, we will disassemble a refrigerant pump, replace the mechanical shaft seal, and reassemble the pump. Detailed instructions will be given regarding the sealed components and their proper installation. Be certain to use only original Cornell factory supplied mechanical seal kits. Mechanical seals from other sources may use elastomers or seal mating materials that may not be suitable for refrigerant applications or oils. Before you begin, prepare a clean workbench where the motor can be cradled or held in place with the bracket extending over the edge of the bench. This makes it easier to remove the bracket from the motor and reinstall it. If the pump is a Model 2CB or CBS, the motor will be supported by the bracket and base and it will not be necessary to unbolt the motor from the bracket. Have a supply of clean rags and the following tools available. For models 1.5 CB and CLB, box or open end wrenches in sizes 3 8, 9 16, 5 8, 11 16, and 3 quarter. A 6 or 8 inch adjustable wrench. A 5 16 Allen wrench. An 8 inch blade type screwdriver. An 8 inch pipe wrench. A small oil filter wrench or strap wrench channel lock pliers, two small pry bars, and a supply of STP or 90 weight or heavier gear oil. For models 2CB and CBS, an additional 7 8 box or opened end wrench will be required. Once the pump has been valved off and drained of refrigerant, the oil can be drained from the seal oil reservoir and the seal chamber. Hold a container under the oil reservoir filler valve. Using the small adjustable wrench or a valve wrench, open the valve. The oil will be under pressure due to the piston spring in the reservoir, so open the valve slowly. If there has been an inboard seal leak, the oil may contain ammonia. Keep your face away from the valve while draining the oil. When the reservoir indicator rod has extended fully and stopped, the oil flow will stop. Leave the valve open to aid in draining the seal chamber. Form a trough out of cardboard or angle iron and hold this under the heater. Use the 11 16th wrench to remove the heater. The remaining seal oil will drain from the seal chamber. For models 1.5 CB and CLB, use the following procedure to remove the pump from the volute. Unscrew the 11 16 nuts on the tube fittings at each end of both the oil supply line and the oil return line and remove these lines.
Unscrew the 11 16th nut on the reservoir pressurization line fitting. Leave this line connected at the volute discharge nozzle, but loosen it. Unscrew the nut on the balance line fitting. Leave this line connected at the suction nozzle fitting. For models 2CB and CBS, also remove the balance line nipple connected to the back plate. Remove the two bolts connecting the reservoir to the angle iron support and set the reservoir aside. To remove the rotating assembly from the volute, Remove the four bolts securing the pump bracket feet to the base. For models 2CB and CBS, leave the bracket bolted to the base. Remove the bolts that secure the volute to the bracket or back plate. Now the motor bracket or back plate and impeller assembly can be backed out of the volute. For demonstration purposes, we will remove the volute and set it aside. If the bracket or back plate does not slide freely out of the volute, check for misalignment and correct as necessary. If properly aligned and the bracket or back plate still does not freely pull out of the volute, then thread two volute bolts into the threaded jack screw holes and tighten them evenly. This will push the bracket or back plate free of the volute. To remove the seal from models 1.5 CB or CLB, arrange and secure the motor, bracket, and impeller assembly with the bracket extending over the side of the workbench. With a 9 16th wrench, remove the right angle tube fitting from the seal gland. Remove the impeller lock screw using the 5 16th Allen wrench. The impeller can be held stationary by gripping the impeller eye with the small oil filter wrench or strap wrench. Insert the two pry bars between the impeller back shroud and the bracket and apply even pressure. The impeller should slide off without excessive force. Have someone hold the impeller or thread a long 3 8 inch bolt into the end of the shaft to prevent the impeller from falling off. If it hits the floor, it might break. With the 9 16 inch wrench, remove the four bolts securing the seal gland to the bracket and slide the gland back against the motor face. Remove the four bolts securing the bracket to the motor register and carefully remove the bracket from the motor. Take care not to drag the bracket against the shaft or seal. To remove the seal from models 2CB and CBS, use the following procedure. After removing the oil lines, gland fitting, and impeller, and unbolting the gland from the back plate, remove the four bolts securing the back plate to the bracket. Support the back plate while removing the bolts so that it doesn't fall against the shaft and seal. Remove the back plate, exercising care not to drag the seal chamber bore against the seal or shaft. The seal and sleeve are now exposed. Simply slide the sleeve, seal and all, off the motor shaft. It is sealed to the shaft with an O-ring and will slide off easily. Remove the outboard stationary seat from the gland. This can be accomplished by laying the gland on the bench, open side down, placing the blade of a screwdriver against the back edge of the seat and firmly tapping the screwdriver with a hammer or the heel of the hand. Similarly, remove the inboard stationary seat from the pump bracket or back plate.
If it is desired to reuse the shaft sleeve, then care must be taken not to scratch the sleeve during seal disassembly. The retainers will be firmly seized to the sleeve, and a great deal of force will be required to remove them. Place one jaw of a pair of channel lock pliers against the back side of the retainer or against the one coil of the seal spring and one jaw against the end of the sleeve and apply pressure, and the retainer should begin to move. Once all the hardware is removed, the sleeve should be inspected for scratches and replaced if necessary. Prior to installing the new seal, thoroughly clean the seal chamber and gland with a solvent and blow the seal chamber out with compressed air. Using rags may leave lint or strings behind which can interfere with the proper functioning of the seal. Install a sleeve o-ring into the sleeve. Lightly lubricate the sleeve o-ring with refrigerant oil and slide the sleeve onto the shaft. Be sure that the sleeve is installed with the chamfered end toward the end of the shaft. Line up the notch in the end of the sleeve with the shaft keyway. Using refrigeration oil, lightly lubricate the o-ring on the outboard stationary seat and press the seat into the gland bore using your thumbs. Wipe the face with a clean, lint-free cloth after installation. Make sure that the lap side of the seat faces the open side of the gland. Carefully inspect the seat to make sure that it is installed squarely in the gland. Coat the face of the stationary seat with clean refrigerant oil. Do not use STP or similar lubricant to lubricate the seal face. Lubricate the O-ring on the inboard stationary seat and install it in the bore of the bracket. Once the seat is placed loosely against the seat bore, reach through from the impeller side of the bracket and pull the seat into place with your thumbs. For models 2CB and CBS, simply push the seat into the back plate with the back plate lying on the workbench. Make sure that the seat is installed squarely in the bore. Coat the face of the stationary seat with clean refrigerant oil. Apply a bead of heavy gear oil or STP to the O-ring groove of the seal gland and install the O-ring in the gland. The heavy oil will keep the O-ring in place during installation of the gland. Place the four gland bolts through the gland holes and carefully slide the gland over the shaft and up against the motor face. Be careful not to drag the gland on the sleeve when placing it over the shaft. Thoroughly coat the sleeve with heavy consistency gear oil or a thin film of STP. Likewise, coat the inside of each seal bellows. For this installation, we will use STP. Place the seal pump against the backside of one of the retainers so that the tab on the seal pump engages one of the slots on the back of the retainer. Some seal pumps may not have this drive tab. Holding the seal pump against the back onto the retainer, push the retainer onto the sleeve with the primary ring facing the gland and slide it nearly to the end of the sleeve nearest the motor face. Slide the retainer back and forth a few times to distribute the lubrication between the sleeve and bellows. Once this procedure has been started, the remainder of the seal installation must be completed quickly. Do not stop for a break. The bellows are designed to seize to the sleeve after a short time. This is what enables the shaft rotation to be transmitted to the seal retainers without them slipping. Slide the spacer sleeve onto the shaft sleeve and up against the back end of the outboard retainer. Apply more heavy consistency oil to the exposed portion of the shaft sleeve. If STP is used, recoating will not be necessary. 
place the seal spring over the spacer and up against the seal pump on the back of the outboard retainer. Now push the inboard retainer onto the sleeve, primary ring facing away from the motor face. Again, move it back and forth a few times to distribute the lubrication. Then slide it toward the outboard retainer just far enough to rest against the spring. It may be fairly difficult to get the inboard retainer started on the sleeve because its bellows squeegees the installation lube off the shaft, but push hard and it will go on. If for some reason it won't slide on freely, apply another thin coat of STP to the inside of the bellows and try again. Quickly position the bracket or back plate over the shaft and against the bolting register. Install two diagonally opposite bolts and tighten them. Be certain that once the inboard stationary seat in the bracket or back plate makes contact with the inboard primary ring, the bracket or back plate is not moved backward away from the motor face even momentarily. If this occurs, the primary ring and stationary seat will stick together and the primary ring will be pulled out of the retainer. Install the impeller key and impeller onto the shaft and tighten the lock screw. This needs to be done before the gland is bolted to the bracket or back plate since the impeller will hold the sleeve in its proper position when the gland is bolted up. Make sure that the oil port on the gland is in the proper orientation before pulling the gland up to the seal chamber face. This should be on the right hand side when facing towards the motor. Using both hands, pull the gland up against the seal chamber face and start two diagonally opposite bolts. Do not relax pressure against the gland until at least two bolts are finger tight against it. If the gland is moved back towards the motor face at any time after the outboard stationary seat and outboard primary ring make contact, the outboard primary ring may be pulled out of its retainer. Once the two gland bolts are tightened, the remaining gland bracket or back plate bolts may be installed and tightened. Reinstall the heater. A small amount of Teflon tape or suitable sealant should be used on the heater threads. It is advisable to pressure test the seal before installing the rotating assembly back into the volute and charging the seal system with oil. Remove the return oil tube fitting from the top of the bracket or back plate. Install a quarter inch NPT plug into the seal gland oil port. Use the quarter inch NPT return oil tap to connect a compressed air line with gauge and valve or a nitrogen bottle with gauge and valve. Slowly pressurize the seal chamber between 50 and 100 psi. Close the valve and watch the gauge for a continuous pressure drop. Also listen for any hissing that would indicate a leak. If a slow leak is detected, relieve the pressure and turn the impeller by hand several quick revolutions. Now, repressurize and observe the gauge. If the slow leak continues, perform the following. Relieve the pressure. Remove the air fitting. Fill the seal chamber with refrigerant oil. Plug the oil return tap. Run the motor for 30 seconds. 
drain the oil, repeat the pressure test. If a leak is still present, remove the seal from the sleeve and inspect it. If no obvious defect on the seal can be found, repeat the seal installation. Once the seal has been successfully tested, reinstall the tube fittings on the gland oil supply port and the oil return port. A small amount of Teflon tape or other suitable sealant should be used on the threads where the fittings screw into the gland and bracket or back plate. No sealant should be used on the tube sides of these fittings. Prior to startup of a new seal, the reservoir should be disassembled, inspected, cleaned, and repaired as necessary. New reservoir O-rings should always be installed when the reservoir is disassembled. For disassembly, it is convenient to clamp the pumpage end cylinder head in a vise. Then using a 916th wrench, remove any two diagonally opposite bolts securing the reservoir heads to the cylinder. Very carefully remove the remaining two bolts. The spring in the reservoir exerts a great deal of force on the reservoir heads, so it may be helpful to have an assistant holding the top reservoir head down while the last two bolts are removed. Alternately, if a large C-clamp is available, the pumpage end and oil end cylinder heads can be clamped in place and all the bolts removed at once. Then the clamp can be carefully loosened. Once the reservoir is apart, the cylinder head O-rings, piston O-ring, and indicator rod O-rings should be removed and discarded. Using a suitable solvent, clean all the reservoir parts, particularly the O-ring grooves. Inspect the cylinder wall for pits, scratches, or corrosion. If there is minor damage to the cylinder walls, a cylinder hone can be used to recondition the cylinder. If there are deep pits or scratches, the cylinder should be replaced. When replacing O-rings, use only those supplied in the Cornell factory O-ring kit. The elastomers used on these O-rings were carefully selected by Cornell for service in ammonia, Freon, and refrigerant oils. Other elastomers may not be compatible with these environments. When reassembling the reservoir, it is helpful to use STP or similar tacky heavy consistency lubricant to hold the cylinder head O-rings in their grooves. This will prevent them from falling out during assembly. The cylinder wall should be well lubricated with a light consistency oil prior to installation of the piston. Refrigeration machine oil is suitable. As with disassembly, hold the pumpage end cylinder head in a vise and install the head O-ring. Set the cylinder on the head and place the spring inside with the small end pointing up. After installing the piston O-ring in its groove, set the piston on the spring. The stop on the back of the piston will fit inside the small end of the spring. A design revision in September of 92 eliminated the stop, so this part may not be in your reservoir. In this case, the small end of the spring will fit over a boss on the back of the piston. Slide the oil end cylinder head over the piston indicator rod and down against the piston face. Do not try to push the piston into the cylinder and then position the cylinder head for bolting. Rather, push the cylinder head against the piston and then down against the end of the cylinder. The piston will be less likely to cock and bind in the cylinder when installed in this manner. While holding the cylinder head down, have someone start two bolts at diagonally opposite corners and run them down finger tight 
so as to hold the cylinder head against the cylinder loosely. Install the remaining two bolts. Tighten all the bolts in a diagonal pattern. Once assembly is complete, push the indicator rod in to be sure that the piston moves freely. This will require considerable force, so it will be necessary to push with a block of wood against the end of the indicator rod. Now the rotating assembly can be reinstalled into the volute. At this point, the volute O-ring groove on the bracket or back plate should be cleaned and a new O-ring installed. If your pump was supplied with a backup O-ring installed between the O-ring groove and the bolting flange, replace this as well. Apply a coat of heavy consistency oil, or STP, to the O-ring to aid in installing the bracket or back plate into the volute. Tighten all the volute bolts in an alternating pattern. If, after bolting the rotating assembly to the volute, there is a gap between the bracket foot and the base, or the formed base and foundation, do not install a bracket foot bolts or base bolts and tighten them down. Shim the foot before bolting down so that no bending stress is applied to the bracket or the volute. Reconnect the balance line from the pump suction flange to the bracket or back plate. Reinstall the oil reservoir and reconnect the oil supply and return lines between the bracket or back plate. The seal gland and the reservoir face. Check all fittings for tightness. It is very important that the correct oil be used in the seal oil reservoir. Consult your manual for a listing of the correct oil for your application. For most applications, use Union Termaco 15 or Exxon z 22. Oils with higher viscosities and poor points may cause seal failure. The correct oils are available through Cornell Pump Company. Connect a hand-actuated oil pump to the filler valve on the face of the oil reservoir and open the filler valve. Pump oil in until the reservoir indicator rod retracts to within one half inch or more from the reservoir face. Do not overfill so that the rod becomes completely retracted. As the oil warms up and expands, the piston must be able to move back or very high hydrostatic pressures can develop in the reservoir and seal chamber and cause the seal to fail. Newer reservoir designs have a built-in oil relief that allows excess oil to vent past the piston rod, preventing overfilling. Once the reservoir is filled, loosen the quarter-inch pipe plug at the top of the reservoir face just enough to allow the air to bleed out. Continue to bleed the reservoir until only oil comes out, then tighten the plug. Now, wire the motor and run it for approximately five seconds to push the air out of the seal chamber and into the top of the reservoir where it can be bled off. Again, loosen the plug and continue bleeding until only oil comes out, then tighten the plug. Pump in just enough additional oil to bring the indicator rod back to one half inch or more from the reservoir face. Be sure to close the filler valve before disconnecting the oil pump. The pump is now ready to be flooded with refrigerant. Carefully follow the startup procedures outlined in your manual. If the manual is not available, please contact Cornell Pump Company or your local Cornell dealer and arrange arrangements will be made to provide you with the necessary manual pages. This program has been produced to assist you in replacing the refrigerant pump seal. If you have any questions about seal replacement or maintenance, please contact Cornell Pump Company.